because people love my work and to get a good message across to them is really awesome. Really think about what you want to have going on behind you and don't underestimate the amount of time that takes to do that because I think I spent close to 30 hours putting my slides together and they were good um, but it takes that it takes at least that amount of time to do it and if you're kind of doing it in the last minute and your slides aren't very good your presentation is going to suffer from it if your slides are great you have that extra confidence to say what you need to say also don't make your slides too busy because people can't focus on much in the space of 15 seconds We take submissions on the website using a, an open source tool that was developed by Egal Koshavoy and a few other people. And you just submit your presentation and all you really need are a few basic things, who you are, your title, a description. We ask for a few optional things like a URL where we can learn more about you. And so you just submit it on the website and we usually open up the submissions for the next Ignite Portland at the following one. So when we ended Ignite Portland 7, Last week, we opened it up for submissions for Night Portland 8, which will be March 3rd. So anybody can submit now, and it's just done online. It's really easy. There's not, not a whole lot of information that you have to provide. It's really easy to start an Ignite in your own city. So these Ignites happen all over the world. They're in Bangalore. They're in Australia. They're in just about every, every country, every continent you can imagine. And O'Reilly, um, some people at O'Reilly are the people who started Ignite, and O'Reilly provides all of these tools that people can use to run their own Ignite. <laughs> hey everybody, you don't have to deal with us any longer. We've got one last band for you this evening. Why don't you go ahead and give a very warm welcome to No Good Jones. Woo! Woo!
Eyes are blind. Presidential speech, limit what your life does do. I wish to be some other two. Jones, let's have a little good time, guys. Get that coffee in us. Walk 
Thank you, No Good Jones. That was awesome. Um, I am doing my uh, sitting by myself over here by the tree. But the what we're going to do is get all set up for Wine Geeks and Food Geeks coming up. But I wanted to let you know that while No Good Jones was playing, they were also having some artists do some artwork over there. And that artwork is going to be available through the 30-hour day auction next week. So we're going to... We're going to be able to auction off that artwork, which is awesome. All that will go to charity. And what we'll also do is get in some of the auction items that we weren't able to get in this time around. So we'll extend the auction. There will be more money going to charities. So pay attention to that all next week for your Christmas shopping pleasure or whatever. So now that you know that, or go spend some money on the auction right now. Whatever. Go check some stuff out. Go buy a tour of the square or like a yacht ride or something. Um, Cammy's ready, I think, and we'll hand over to Food Geeks and Wine Geeks over there, and I'll meet them over there. So head on over. I'll meet you over there. Maybe. There you go. Nope. That's nice. I like that. That's yeah, like an that AT&T kind of commercial of somehow. I like it. I like it's kind of awesome. And this, does no one else appreciate the beauty of We're trying to get the monitor turned around so folks here can see. Hey, Rick. Yeah. What time is it? It's about, we're, we've only got about three and a half hours to go. So it's 6.30? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Almost out of time. We, we got a lot to do. Still got a lot to shove in. Maybe we should say hi to Ryan and Crystal. Why don't we do that? <laughs> they were nice enough to stop by. Hi, Ryan and Crystal. Hello. Hello. How are you guys? It's been a very long time since I've seen you. A very long time. Right. <laughs> we're doing well. Glad to be yeah. back. Yeah? Yeah. Why don't you let us know what it is that we're going to be doing here? Because we've got all these very precisely laid out glasses. Yeah. I saw you got shining each of them. <laughs> You've got your, your bottle opener. Not a bottle opener, your wine opener. Uh -huh. You have to forgive me. How many hours? <laughs> Someone could tell you. We've been, been awake, awake quite a while. It's a while. It's my school, yes. yes. You've got a bucket. <laughs> We've got a bucket. You've got water pitchers. So we What's are going on? we're essentially all set up for a wine tasting. Mm -hmm. So um, what I've brought is I brought six wines that I think are great bang for buck wines. Okay. Okay. And so, so not necessarily the best wines, but for what you're paying, they are the best wines. Exactly. Okay. So essentially what I've done is um, I've been working at finding great wines at $12, like right around a $12 okay. price mm -hmm. point. And so what I figured I'd do is I'd, I'd talk about how to find those wines and to feel like you're getting a great value for, for what, you're ba what you're buying. Um, so these are six great examples that I think uh, that I think uh, we'll we'll enjoy together. Cool. I think especially given the holiday season and the economic crunch that everyone is, this is a perfect way to go. Yes. I love it. <laughs> yeah. So shall we get started yeah. here? Should we sit down? Okay. Sure, if you'd like. Well, I asked Ryan the question that I'm sure he's been asked many, many times. As soon as people find out that he's a sommelier. Um, of course, how do we find well, how do we find the best? And so he started explaining to me that there are some appellations, and if you know the names of those appellations, then you can be confident that you're going to get uh, a delicious wine and not have to spend as much as you would for something like a champagne that has the name brand recognition. So. Exactly. So, um, so essentially, uh, you know, we're we're really familiar with Chianti and Bordeaux and Burgundy and Napa Valley. So there are a lot of um, a lot of wine regions that are really pricey, where you're going to spend, you know, forty to fifty dollars for for a bottle of wine, and that's kind of the price that you're going to need to spend just to feel like you're getting a really good bottle. Um, so, 
what um, what you can do in order to uh, reduce the pain that your wallet is going to feel is to is to really know the the lesser known appellations and the lesser known wine regions that um, uh, that you can buy those wines from. So, um, so Rick, you're from Walla Walla, is that right? I went to school in Walla Walla. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, and and of course, the primary uh, thing that Walla Walla is known for is wheat fields. Oh wait, that's when <laughs> I went to school there. So all the wheat fields. It used to be all wheat fields, and now. Um, it's pretty much all converted over to wineries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you've got the wine, and then you've also got onions, right? right, right. And so, um, so both of those things, um, they have this defined region called an appellation, where it's a, a geographical boundary within which those um, grapes can be grown, okay. or those onions can be grown in order to call it an, an official wine or onion from Walla Walla. Right. So, so these are. Um, so when we say appellation, that's that's really what we're talking about. Um, so why don't we get started here? Uh, we're going to start with what, Miss Crystal? Our first is a prosecco. Mm -hmm. This is Fago Nero. Yes. Yeah, so um, this is um, one of my favorite wines at the moment. Um, this is a, uh, a sparkling wine from the northern part of Italy, um, from specifically the uh, the Veneto region of Italy. Um, so this particular wine is a, a great bubbly wine that serves as a great aperitif, a great way to sort of. I'm just gonna avoid the elbow. <laughs> what? Personal. Uh, a great way to. <laughs> 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 just been a long. <laughs> yeah, we don't need any crazy mishaps toward the end. No, no, thank you. Uh, so this is a sparkling wine, but uh, but we use a, a, a. It actually has a real cork. Mm -hmm. um, these are not as powerful as some of the champagnes and whatnot, um, so um, so they don't need to have like the protective covering over it. It's not going to, when you pop it open, it's not going to pop and and hit the ceiling. So. So this is a $14 bottle we're looking at. It's good for mimosas and bellinis. Exactly. And you pair this with a charcuterie. Yeah, so this will make a great pairing with a charcuterie plate. Um, what you'll what you'll find is that it's got a nice little frizzante and a great acidity to it, and that will kind of help it to um, to kind of cleanse as you're eating the salami and you get those oils stuck to uh, the side of your cheeks. Then it will help um, it will help clean that off. So uh, I suppose we should just go ahead and start. So cheers, and here's cheers. to a, uh, a good 30-hour day. Now, after after 26 hours of being awake, does uh, does that taste good? <laughs> it does. It actually, yeah, it, it tastes kind of refreshing at this mm -hmm. point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can't really. I don't know that my taste buds are really tasting anything <laughs> at this point. I'm surprised my tongue is still moving. Refreshing. But it is. It, yeah, it's quite refreshing. Yeah. It's not as dry as the champagne. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yeah, you'll find um, I guess some notes of like some green apple, mm -hmm. um, a little chalkiness to it, um, as well as um, it's not as dry as what you might expect. I mean, most people when they um, when they go to weddings and they they tip back that champagne glass, they immediately you know, give that puckery face where where they're um, uh, where they're um, <laughs> where they're uh, uh, where it's so dry that they just need something yeah. immediately afterwards. But this has a touch of sweetness to it that kind of reduces yeah, that yeah, pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Oh, and there's the is that the is that the image behind the bottom behind? Mm -hmm. cool. Exactly. So that's the uh, that's the um, bottle of prosecco here. So prosecco is something that um, that you can find from nine to seventeen dollars. Mm -hmm. um, the nine dollar bottles are are great. They they work just pretty well. Um, so uh, so there's something that are, are really fun uh, to to start a party with or to to start a dinner with. So there's hijinks occurring under the table. Don't anybody mind that? Don't pay attention to the man under the table. Yeah, we could. Um, we could. Uh, I suppose we could probably move to the second here, okay. if you like, if you're ready. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've got the bucket here that yeah. you can um, either spit in if you 
don't want to consume any alcohol or um, to or dump, dump the, um, the wine in as well. Mm -hmm. So the second bottle is And a we are done with these okay. champagne glasses. This is by Huber. And this is an $11 bottle from uh, Mendoza, Argentina. Yeah, we need this from, again. this will be from, that would Gruner be the Zolo. The Gruner, <laughs> I just picked up the wrong bottle. Okay, this is a Gruner Veltliner <laughs> um, from Austria, a $10 bottle. It was a very complicated opening today. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so... Um, it's wonderful that uh, that the corkscrew has made its way to wine, or to, uh, the corkscrew, the <laughs> the screw top. Thank you. Um, so essentially, that uh, makes it much more easy to open up, but it also reduces the likelihood that we um, that the wine will be infected by uh, a. Um, uh, a bacteria called uh, trichloroanisole. And, and when people say that there's a corked wine, uh -huh. that's what they really mean, that, it's, um, that that wine has been infected by this bacteria that was attached to the cork. Now, okay. now cork is actually harvested from, from trees. So it's actually tree bark that is then converted into um, and, and compressed into, um, into a cork and put on a bottle. If it's got that bacteria, yeah. then it could infect the entire wine. Okay. So this will help us, um, help us get away from that little problem there. So I love this kind of a wine where, um, where it just really kind of um, screams. The, the nose is really clean. It's really, really crisp, mm -hmm. um, smelling already. It reminds me um, of Sprite. Yeah. But it doesn't have like the, um, the corn syrup that you might like experience in a Sprite. <laughs> right. Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> Um, well, this is um, this would be the kind of wine that I would probably pair with. Um, there are a couple things that I want to pair this with. Maybe something like fish tacos, because it has a high acidity. It, it would work well with like a really light meal like that. Yeah. Um, it would also work really well, I think, with um, uh, like India, because it has some of those. Um, it will, would pair really well with some of those crazy spices. Yeah. That, uh, that you find in, a, in an Indian dish. That's interesting because I think like one of the mistakes I often make is trying to pair a very heavy wine with a very spicy dish. Like you think you need to have the have the flavors compete in right. some way. And so that's interesting that something this light would be complementary to that kind of stuff. Yeah, and I think that's kind of one of that's one of the very difficult things about food and wine pairing is trying to figure out, especially when you're kind of new to wine, is how to how to do a proper food and wine pairing. Um, and and so typically when you go into an Indian restaurant, you'll see Cabernet Sauvignon and Merlot yep. and Syrah and all of these wines that that really don't work very well. If you're if you're talking about um, finding balance and finding something that complements the meal, it typically will kind of clash a little bit. The spices don't really work together, um, and the the bodies don't really work together. Yep. So this is something that will kind of help um, uh, it it will pick up some of the, the nuances of the Indian food and, and help them to kind of open up a little bit in your mouth, mm -hmm. um, as well as bringing the great cleansing property of, of um, washing some of those crazy spices down as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, as well as putting the fire out, too. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, what do you think? What would you pair with it? I would pair fish tacos. <laughs> oh, hey. <laughs> Who knew? Fish, butter. There we go. Buttery fish. All right. Greek food. I think Greek would be great with this as well. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, why don't we move to the next wine here? I always feel so bad when we dump all of this wine out. You but, would uh, feel worse if Rick and I drank it. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> Everybody else would feel worse about that, right? <laughs> It'd be a sugar rush for us. And what do we have here, Miss Beasley? We are actually doing a Torontes. Right. <laughs> Torontes is from Mendoza, Argentina. This is an $11 bottle. It is. And now, 
So when it comes to uh, uh, Mendoza, Argentina, the thing that we think most is Malbec. Oh. <laughs> I was trying to keep it up. And, and so while oh. Malbec is definitely a great bang for buck wine, I didn't want to feature it here because I think it's one of those commonly known wines. So um, if you're looking for a good fruity red wine, then I think that would be a, a great one to do. Mm -hmm. um, but this is one of my, my new favorites. Did you want to get that dumped out? I would love that. Yeah. <laughs> do you mind dumping this yeah, out for Crystal? Um, so this is a, a great um, white wine that is um, primarily grown in, in Argentina. Now, way back when, when the Bass settlers moved over to Argentina, they this was one of the grapes that they brought with them. Um, so this, the Torontes grape is originally from like the Galicia and um, the, uh, I think, Castilla, Castilla y Leon um, regions of, of northern, um, northern Spain. And so when they brought this over, it just kind of took off in, in Argentina. It's something that grew really well in that climate. And, uh, and so you've seen, um, and we're seeing a lot of Torontes being produced right now. And in my opinion, this is one of the best bang for buck wines on the market. It's something that not many people know about. Mm -hmm. It's typically like just under $12, and it, uh, it makes for a great food and wine pairing. So the one thing that I think you miss at home, that you, people almost always think of white wine as being chilled. These wines are all being served at room temperature. Yeah, so... Or, or, I mean, very slightly below. But. Right, and part of that's because of transportation and getting here. Um, but the, the other thing is that each white and each red has kind of an ideal temperature that you'd want to serve it at. Um, a Riesling would be something that you want to serve really, really cold, mm -hmm. like at 45 degrees. But, um, but the Tyrone taste, um, a Chardonnay, you want to serve like closer to like 50 to 52 degrees. Mm -hmm. um, it will help exp the... Um, the characteristics and the aromas will tend to come out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, what do you think? It's got a lot of like perfume to it. Yeah. Like it's flowery. very, yeah, very flowery. Yeah. 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 That's uh, that's my favorite part of this wine is the uh, the honeysuckle like aroma that comes out of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, I think it's pretty fun. Mm -hmm. I bought this in a box at Fred Meyer's for I think I got a liter or a liter and a half for about twelve dollars. Oh wow. And it was very lovely. Yeah. So, Interesting. Great bargain. Yeah. And this would be sushi? Um, I would love to pair this with sushi. Um, one of the things that this reminds me of is the um, is the pickled ginger that you get on the mm -hmm. side of your sushi uh -huh. plate. And how between each bite you you use the ginger to kind of cleanse the palate yeah. and prepare you for the um, um, for the next uh, the next roll or the next uh, bite of sashimi. Um, so I think this would work really well there. Yeah. yeah. And again, this is what eleven dollars for for this particular bottle. So I think it's I think it's a pretty good find at that at that price. Yeah. No. <laughs> Bucket <laughs> Brigade. <laughs> you guys have no excuse. <laughs> well, I need to put the next one in my in my glass. <laughs> We're in a timeline here, people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So the next wine is the Grillos. It's a Dow from Portugal. Mm -hmm. So, um, so wines from the Dow region of Portugal. They're um, they're from northern Portugal, uh, and these are this particular wine region is just south of the Douro region. The Douro region is where um, port wine is made. And so uh, what Portugal is predominantly known for is, um, is port wine. But outside of that, there are a lot of really wonderful wines, still wines, that people just don't really know about. This being one of them. So... Hearing ooze and ahs. <laughs> 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 so my notes say that this is a very elegant red, similar to a Pinot Noir. Yes. 
Sorry about that. Um, so this particular wine is has kind of been um, known as something that's going to closely match um, the wines of Burgundy. It's going to be something that's typically um, a little bit more nuanced, um, a little softer, maybe. Mm -hmm. Than, than a lot of wines in that region. Um, and it's something that's really easy to drink. Now this is gonna need probably another um, 15 minutes to really open up and, um, and, and show kind of its true colors. Um, the, the notes that I'm picking up are gonna be um, like black cherry and black raspberry, mm -hmm. but it's kind of got that, that deep broodiness that almost you know, would make it a really good pairing with pork or maybe even um, meats that are straight off the barbecue as well. Huh. So, yeah. <laughs> no. How do you like this wine, Cami? I think it's a little tight still. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I probably would like it. <laughs> it could a little. Yeah. Or if I had slept. <laughs> so this one gave me just a tiny bit of the bone dry in my jaw feeling, mm -hmm. just the t tiniest hint of that. Mm -hmm. What is that from? And tell the people that think I'm crazy that I'm not actually crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you are crazy, but um, uh, but to speak about the feeling in the jaw, um, that is uh, the the feeling of um, the sensation of tannins. Um, so tannins are uh, chemical com compounds that are found in the grape skin in, in, as well as in an oak wine barrel. So as the, um, as the wine ages in the oak, it kind of takes on some of those oak properties from the barrel. So when you feel like that, that really like almost painful, like mm -hmm. in, the, in the back of the cheek, um, that, is, that is one of the things that's going on is the, the tannins kind of um, <laughs> Here uh, he comes again. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Drop the, the cork screw. <laughs> um, so, so that's something that tannins are something that will kind of go away a little bit as the wine opens up. Um, they are something that will also help some wines to age a little bit longer. Okay. So, the older that a wine gets, the more subdued that the tannins become and the more that they'll kind of integrate into the wine and you won't notice them as readily when you, uh, when you take that first sip. So if it's more aged, you have less? <laughs> <laughs> typically. It depends on the Maybe wine, but, um, like but typically most, uh, most reds really work that way. I've heard it described as um, the difference between eating a peach peeled and unpeeled. You know, when you have a peach that hasn't been peeled, you get that little extra bit of bite. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then you just taste the sweetness if it's peeled. So. Mm -hmm. um, Why do wine makers look for the tannins? Well, it's, um, it, it's essentially, I mean, winemakers are trying to find um, what's going to be a great balance for, for their wine. Sometimes when we purchase a wine and drink it immediately, it's still a little bit too young. And, and it needs a little more time, a year or two years, in order to um, have those tannins soften and in order to kind of come into what is going to be the best expression for that particular wine. Um, so this is one wine that probably could use another couple years in the bottle just to help it kind of soften up a bit. Um, so what, what winemakers typically do is they try and make the best expression of the wine, but it's up to you to know how, up to us as consumers to know when the best time to open that wine is. So it's it's kind of tricky like that. It's not always when you buy it. It's not always when you buy it. Exactly. Exactly. So this is a 2006 vintage. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the cheaper the wine is, the sooner it should be drank. I I think that's pretty typically the case. If you're if you're paying um, 75 or 100 dollars for a bottle, then typically it's meant to to age. It's something that is going to. Uh, uh, typically, not always, but typically is made to cellar well, is made to, um, to open in five or ten years for a special occasion, mm -hmm. for that, you know, uh, that, that, that pig that you're roasting or for a, a rack of lamb or something like that. Um, so, so typically that is the case, but not always. Yeah. So, all right. Okay. They finished them. 
No, I know, we downed them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we weren't even looking. They were even downed them. I thought, wow, they really <laughs> like that one. You can put it up here. That way I don't splash <laughs> on you. Okay. Or more importantly, on me. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Mm -hmm. So our next bottle is a Long Rosso. This is a $10 bottle, uh, a very dry red from the Piedmont in Italy. Exactly. So um, the, the Piedmont region of Italy is it's the northern part of Italy. It's a um, uh, it's where you know Oso Buco uh, essentially comes from. There are a lot of really wonderful wines there: um, Barolo and, and Barbaresco, Barbera di Alba, Dolcetto di Alba. There are all sorts of really amazing wines, and this is one of those wines. It's a really good wine, but it kind of gets lost in the mix. You don't really hear about it as much as you hear about some of the other wines. Um, Another thing to point out about this particular wine is this little label here um, at the top. Uh, I think we talked about it a couple um, Strange Love Live episodes ago. It's the uh, um, a, a DOC label. Now, DOC means Denominazione di Originata Controllata, which means a controlled appellation of, a, of origin. So this is one of those balance and checks that Italian wines in the Italian wine um, police, if you will, have in place to make Why sure that... They take it very seriously. <laughs> they take it way too seriously. But and if you don't follow the recipe, you're not eligible to get this little band. Is that correct? Exactly. Hmm. So um, part of the reason that they have it is to make sure that the grapes are actually grown in the region from which it states in the label. It's like NASCAR. It's like NASCAR. Or champagne. <laughs> um, exactly, like champagne. Um, so what they're trying to do is they're trying to ensure that other regions or other producers that aren't in that particular region don't um, don't try and masquerade as that particular region. Oh, no. <laughs> settle down, settle down. Um, so they're trying to make sure that they don't masquerade as that particular region. There was a, a real big problem with with Champagne and with uh, with Chianti as well, where back in the day, um, people from everywhere were trying to um, capitalize off of the bad pour right here, um, trying to capitalize off of the Chianti name, and so they were creating um, wines from all over Italy and just calling it Chianti, and what that did was essentially to um, lessen the um, the value of the the Chianti name. So that's why we have those crazy little labels at the top of, of the wine bottles. So this is a Longue. I'm very excited to try this because the other grapes that are grown in this region are some of my very favorite reds. Which, which ones are those? Well, Montalcino is the home of Brunello, mm -hmm. and I have a very sentimental attachment to that as well uh, because I visited there. Um, that's a gorgeous town, isn't it? It is a fantastic town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you're a big fan of uh, Barbera de Alba, too. Barbera right? de Alba, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think this particular one is actually from, like, right around the town of Alba. Um, so you probably experience, re-experience, like, the Barbera sensation here in this wine. What do you all think? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bitter for me right now. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's going to need a little it time needs, as well. Yeah, yeah. It, it tastes like it needs some opening. Mm-hmm. Um, this is my fault because I thought we needed the drama of opening all the bottles <laughs> on camera, so it's my fault that the reds have not been decanted properly. <laughs> well, I think, um, I think there's definitely a lot of romanticism that takes place in the opening of a wine bottle, uh -huh. which is kind of why the corkscrew or the, uh, the 